Good morning to you all again. If we haven't had the chance to meet, I'm Robbie Itterberg. I'm one of the pastors. And last week, I actually had the opportunity to go to Colorado with my oldest son. And we even got to go skiing because there was snow, like real snow, not like East Coast snow, but like real snow. And there was snow on the roads at one point, and I, I found myself thinking about all sorts of times in my life growing up in Colorado where I had either ridden in cars or driven in the snow. I was thinking about the time when I thought it would be a really good idea for my now wife, Abby, to drive in a total blizzard because I figured it would be a great time for her to get confident driving in the snow. I was wrong. <laughs> I was thinking about the time where I was driving my 1989 Mercury Topaz down this hill on Haiwan Drive in Evergreen where I grow up and just ahead of me I see a snowbank and I have this picture in my mind of this moment of glory launching off of the snowbank and so I decide to speed up as I'm approaching the snowbank and I'm going a little bit faster because I mean it is a topaz and I get to the snowbank and start to go up and then stop completely stuck in the snowbank. And so I did what most of us would do at that moment, and I slammed on the gas, trying to get myself free. And instead, the tires just started spinning and spinning and spinning. I was completely stuck. Eventually had to be pulled out by winch. See, this is a great image, as I was thinking about that this week, for the new sermon series that we're starting today. Because the reality is, we are all stuck in some way or some ways. And so we're beginning a new series this morning called Unstuck, where we want to explore the ways in our lives where we may be stuck, and even more, acknowledge it and invite God into the journey with us to help us become unstuck, so we can move into a better and a different future than the one we've been living in and stop just spinning our tires in the same old patterns and places. And so this morning we're going to jump into a story from Judges, the book of Judges, chapter 16, and begin to think about patterns of stuckness and how it may be time for us to get unstuck. And this is a great story. It's a little longer, perhaps, than you're used to us reading, but hang in there. It is so worth it. It is a great and compelling story. So I invite you, if you'd like, follow along on the screen as we read and hear God's word for us today. Sometime later, Samson fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered her, if anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she tied him, up, him with them. With men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, you have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. <clears throat> so Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then with men hid in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Delilah then said to Samson, all this time you have been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, If you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric on the loom and tighten it with the pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric, and tightened it with the pin. Again she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin and the loom with the fabric. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you? When you won't confide in me, this is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. 
No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite, dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding grain in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to celebrate, saying, Our god has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their god, saying, Our god has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, Put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple, so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there, and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood. Bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other, Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. Then his brothers and his father's whole family went down to get him. They brought him back and buried him between Zorah and Eshtael in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had led Israel 20 years. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we invite you in this moment to send your spirit to help us understand the word you have for us this morning. May you illuminate it. Make it clear for us that ultimately we can respond as you would lead. In Jesus' name, amen. So meet Samson, a a Nazarite, as you saw in the story, meaning he was set apart before birth for a special purpose. As a matter of fact, if you go a few chapters earlier in Judges 13, an angel has showed up to his parents and had told them that this son, Samson, who would be born, will be the one who will begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. And so then you see Samson's story unfold in chapters 13 through 16. We just read chapter 16. And I'd understand if you heard this story for the first time or again, and you're like, come on, really? Like, Are you kidding me? This is kind of ridiculous. I mean, Delilah's agenda is not exactly subtle, is it? I mean, right out of the gates. She's like, tell me your secret. How can you be tied up and subdued? You know, she's totally sold out her husband. You know, it's a dysfunctional relationship from the very beginning. She's selling him out. There's no loyalty, no bond, no love, no affection. And you might be wondering, like, how is this even possible? How could Samson let himself even go through this? I think the answer is he's stuck. He's stuck in patterns of living, patterns of his own making, some that he's aware of, others that he's probably not even aware of that are functioning underneath the surface, and he's just instinctively following whatever's going on inside of him. If you read his whole story, he's got a pattern of chasing women, specifically forbidden women. Delilah is actually his third wife. And all of them from among the Philistine people who were not the people of God. They weren't supposed to intermarry with the Philistines. Samson was supposed to deliver them from the Philistines, but instead he's marrying them and pursuing them. He's attracted to them, drawn to them physically. And it always goes badly, but he keeps going back for more. Other patterns that come out in this part of his story that we read 
Right, three times we see Delilah lures him, either physically or emotionally, trying to get him to spill the secret of his strength. And each time, Samson, well, he lies to her. Not exactly a great foundation for a relationship, is it? But he lies to her, and she then tries to tie him up and sets a trap, inviting the guys who are trying to kill him even into their very own bedroom. Wakes Samson up. He breaks free, he kills some Philistines, repeat the pattern again and again and again. So what's the deal? I mean, it's kind of ridiculous when we think about it, and we might think, man, if I was in this, like, if this is me, there's no way I would go through this charade over and over again. And and that's probably true if you were in this exact circumstance. But how many times in your life Have you done the same thing over and over again and looked back and thought, man, that was just silly. Why did I do that? Or have you ever said to yourself, I am never going to do that again? Famous last words, aren't they? See, we find ourselves perhaps not in Samson's exact circumstance and situation, but I believe in Samson's same problem of humanity, where we get stuck in patterns often unconsciously. Eventually, Samson gives in to another pattern where that one last time Delilah pleaded with him. I can imagine she's giving him the puppy dog eyes. How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? A reasonable response would be, how could you say you love me when you're trying to kill me? But Samson doesn't go there. Instead, we're told in verse 16 that Delilah kept nagging him and nagging him and nagging him and nagging him. And he gives in to her nagging. What an, another very common pattern in our relationships, isn't it? A nagger and a naggy. And some days you're one and some days you're the other. And I see, don't look around at each other. That's not nice. That's not nice. But for Samson, here, there is clearly a total lack of boundaries. He doesn't tell her the truth based on values and principles. He doesn't tell her the truth in order to honor her as his wife or to love her or care for her because he believes in integrity and honesty. No, he just kind of blurts it out because she nags him and wears him down. He isn't living based on principles. He's reacting emotionally in the circumstance. And if you find yourself reacting most of the time, perhaps not even living by the values that you have for yourself, it's because you don't have a clear, healthy sense of boundaries of the person you want to be, of how you want to live in each moment, instead just giving in to the emotional pressures like Samson has done. And she lures him to sleep, having given up his secret, has the guys come and shave his head. Now he's weak and is going to be carried off to Gaza as a prisoner. And yet what perhaps is the most striking in this whole story of Samson, perhaps the underlying pattern of dysfunction in his life, is his incredible arrogance. Right? He's been given this gift of God, incredible strength, and yet he has claimed it as his own, using it for whatever he wanted, wherever he wanted it. You can read it throughout his whole story. And in this part of the story, even after he's given away the secret We're told that when she calls to him and says, hey, the Philistines are upon you, he wakes up and thinks to himself, you know what? No big deal. I'll just go out as before and shake myself free. What hubris. He hadn't realized the Lord had left him. Hadn't respected the fact that the gifts that he had were from God and were not for his purposes and his pleasure, but were intended to be a part of God's bigger plan and purpose. But in his arrogance, he's blinded and taken a prisoner. And you might have thought that having your eyes gouged out and being thrown into prison and being humiliated by having to now perform amongst uh, uh, thousands of people, that it might have caused Samson to pause for a moment and do some introspection. To at least for a moment begin to ask, man, how did I get here? That it might have brought him to a place of considering his part that he played in his story, but instead, 
Instead, most of us actually don't like to do that, do we? Most of us, we don't like to sit and honestly and objectively consider, how did I get here? How did I get stuck in this? Because that often requires confronting things about myself or acknowledging things within ourselves that we've either been trained to hide or have chosen to ignore or aren't very pleasant or attractive. And so rather than taking the time for the introspection and figure out what he might learn, Samson instead ignores his unfaithfulness and pleads with God for strength one last time so that he can get revenge on his enemies for his two eyes. His pattern of arrogance and vengeance and violence. Samson is stuck in a story of his own making that's spiraling out of control. Do you find that you're stuck too? See, because there's lots of ways we can be stuck. You can be stuck in serial relationships, never really satisfied, making the same mistakes over and over again. Stuck in patterns of lies and deceit in order to try to just keep the peace. You can be stuck in the pattern of going through the motions daily, just going to work, going to school, doing the stuff, doing the activities, but it's empty and it's hollow. Kind of like jumping inside a dryer and going around over and over and over. We can be stuck in patterns of bitterness and unforgiveness, stuck in a lack of boundaries and principles and values, stuck in allowing the past to define us, stuck in being a victim in every moment, thinking and believing the world is constantly against us and the problems are always on the outside of us. We can be stuck in anger and withdrawal and denial. We can be stuck in fear and retreat. We can be stuck in people pleasing. We can be stuck in addictions. We can be stuck in joyless religion and rules. We can be stuck in despair and apathy, stuck in gossip. We can be stuck in vengeance and revenge. We can be stuck on a performance treadmill. We can be stuck Stuck, 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 and these are just a few of the many possible examples. We're all stuck, one way or another. And you may be thinking, oh, I'm not stuck. <laughs> you know, this is a great series for lots of other people because I know lots of people who are stuck. And frankly, I'm sick of hearing it from them how stuck they are. So this will be great for them. I'm not like Samson, I'm good. But if you're thinking that the story of Samson is not about you, then that may be exactly where you are stuck. See, because Samson was stuck in his arrogance. So arrogant to not consider the pitfalls of the patterns of his thinking and behavior, his way and approach to life. He was too arrogant to do the work of introspection. He believed he wasn't stuck. He was conquering. He was overcoming. He had it all put together. And there was nothing that could hold him down. Oh, yeah. Except for himself. His inability and unwillingness to look at himself. He thought he'd be just fine even when he gave away his secrets, underestimating the destruction that he was bringing on himself and even on his people, Israel, that he was supposed to be saving. If you think you're not stuck, the reality is you may be setting yourself up for an incredible amount of pain. Pain for yourself, pain for others in your life who know you're stuck, and they may even be bearing the weight of it. Because the reality is we are all stuck. We are all works in progress. We're all on a journey of maturity, hopefully someday becoming like Jesus. But the problem for Samson, and perhaps for us, the problem is that he was practicing what Peter Scazzaro would call emotionally unhealthy spirituality. This is the kind of spirituality that disconnects our relationship with God from our emotions and emotional processes that are happening underneath the surface of our lives. It's a spirituality that puts religious activity, which is visible on the outside, on display as some sort of demonstration of our spirituality and our faith, but ignores that there's a lot going on inside that isn't visible to the world, possibly not even to ourselves, that Jesus wants to transform and change and mature. See, Samson is driven by his passions. 
his sexual desires, his arrogance, his desire for violence and revenge. He has an unexamined heart and unexamined emotions. His emotional processes are unacknowledged, unexamined, and certainly not surrendered to the God who made him. Perhaps if Samson had started to think for a moment, why do I keep doing the things that I'm doing? Maybe after the first time Delilah tried to have him murdered, he would have gone like, whoa, honey, this isn't working for me. Like, we need to work on our relationship, I think. But instead, he continued in the patterns of unexamined behavior. Have you ever thought about the connection between your emotions and your spirituality? Your emotions and your faith journey? Or have these been two separate ideas for you? If you've been in churches for a while, you may have kind of been shaped like many with the assumption that the goal of being a church person is to fill your head with a whole lot of information and then to behave, conform. And so the assumption was that the more you knew, the more mature you were becoming. Well, that's not really how it works, is it? I mean, the reality is, as Schizero says in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, emotional health and spiritual maturity are inseparable. It is not possible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. It isn't possible. Because you're a whole being, a whole person. You can't divide yourself up, physical, spiritual, emotional. That's just weird. You're an integrated whole. At no point has your spirit gone off and done something that your body and your emotions were not a part of. Even as Christians, our ultimate hope is an integrated hope. When we die or at the end of history, our hope that we're looking forward to is not becoming disembodied spirits like ghosts separated from our body. Our hope is a resurrection hope. Jesus is a resurrection Lord. We are bodily for all eternity. You're going to have a body in eternity. Now, it's not going to be the one you have right now. You're welcome. That's Jesus' doing. He's giving you a new one. But we will be embodied. Embodied spirit and emotion. Jesus says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Your whole being. And so if your practice of spirituality... Your practice of Christianity doesn't integrate your emotionality, then it is an incomplete and stunted spirituality. And that's what this journey, Unstuck, is about for us. And I'd encourage you, if if you haven't, to get a copy of that book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. We have some available in the Welcome Center. If you'd like, if you like e readers, they're available on all e readers. But this is part of our eight week journey. Because this dysfunctional, separated spirituality, disconnected from our emotions, takes us out of the story that God wants to write in our lives. And I believe he has a powerful and a beautiful thing, beautiful story that he wants to write in your life. See, Samson was intended to deliver his people from their enemies, from oppression, from injustice. Instead, in the end, he just kills a few while destroying himself. And God has a story he wants to write in your life and through your life to shape you as a person so that you can become a greater influence in the world around you. And I gotta tell you, right now, in this point in history, we desperately need a new emotional health. And an emotional health rooted in what Jesus has done will be a powerful and beautiful thing. And it will, it will shape your life and influence others. It will shape their eternity. Because our world is floundering in hopelessness and isolation and fear and despair and unexamined patterns of dysfunction and behavior. And you're invited into a new story. You're invited to get unstuck. But how does it happen? Well, unfortunately, it happens and it starts by being brutally honest. And I say unfortunately because Most of us learned that honesty is the best policy, except for when it comes to being really honest. Because that's not safe. And it's not okay. 
But honesty opens up the possibility to something new. Being brutally honest begins the journey of transformation. It's why that's the first step in all of the 12-step programs that have been so powerful to free people from patterns of addictions. What's step one? It's incredible honesty about the state of life and admitting powerlessness over our ability to conquer whatever we're addicted to. I was a part of a church in Seattle many years back that had a 12-step program for non-addicts, or at least not addicted to substances. What we find is we're all addicted mostly to ourselves. And in step one, as I participated in this journey, the invitation was to get incredibly honest. And I, there was a workbook that we were using at the time, part of the, it was called the 12 Steps of Spiritual Journey. And I just, I'm going to share with you what I wrote. This is a quote of what I wrote at that time. Because I realized I was stuck. Rationally, I know that my life is unmanageable. I feel it in the chaos of my being, my stress, my anxiety, my harshness, even the state of my office space. Yet I don't know how to surrender. I'm able to manage and achieve tasks at a high level, but relationships are weak to non-existent. I'm powerless, yet keep grasping for power. Power is safe. Powerlessness is scary and vulnerable. I was raised to take responsibility and to believe I could always change my situation. I still live this way. High stress. High pride. I was stuck. I was stuck in patterns that came from my background. I was stuck in patterns of my own making. And the beginnings of movement were in brutal honesty about how unmanageable my life had become where I was stuck. And it opened the door, and it will open the door for you to the new possibilities of the new thing Jesus wants to do, like the new wine that he wanted to put in the, the wineskins. Where he said in Mark 2, as we read earlier, you can't put new wine in old wineskins. They're going to explode. And what Jesus was getting at is he's saying, you can't put new patterns of thinking, of interacting with other people, of spiritual activity into your old ways of living. It doesn't work. You have to be broken open for something new to take root in you. And Jesus wants to do something new in you. I believe it in these eight weeks and beyond, that Jesus wants to heal wounds that you may not even have realized were there or thought had closed but remain open. Jesus wants to restore relationships that have been severed for years. Jesus wants to free you from patterns of sin that you may have tried valiantly to overcome in your own but haven't been able to. You keep spinning your tires. He wants to move you out of patterns of thinking, of interacting, ways of believing and behaving that are holding you back from the powerful story he wants to write in your life. He wants to get you unstuck. And hear me clearly, it's not about arriving. This isn't, we didn't call this series arrival, like you're going to somehow end in eight weeks at a place of maturity. It's about getting unstuck. It's about beginning to move forward, beginning to move toward the new thing that Jesus wants to do in your life. But lastly, I just want to acknowledge it's going to take courage. Because the emotional reflection and honesty that we're talking about, it can be hard. Taking off the masks, owning our stuff, it can be disorienting and vulnerable and scary. It's part of why I would so encourage you to join a group for this journey. And I know when I say that, you're like, yeah, no thanks. I don't want to let anybody else into this, but I want to tell you, it could be the most transformative experience for you if you go on this journey with other people. Because you'll learn that you're not alone in your stuckness. You'll learn that you're not uniquely flawed and broken, that you're just as messed up as the rest of us. Welcome to the family. But you'll also hear stories of hopefulness where God has moved in other people's lives, bringing them out of places of being stuck. Maybe even in this present journey, seeing God do it right before your eyes, moving them out of places of stuckness, can only kindle a hope in you that maybe that can happen for you too. I'd encourage you to join a group. Check out groups in the Welcome Center. Be courageous. And Jesus knows how hard this can be. He knows the temptation to give up and not participate, to check out for like eight weeks and then say, yeah, I'll come back later. He knows the temptation, men, to say, yeah, this is really for women because it's about emotions. 
he knows the temptation to give up on the story that God wanted to write in his own life because he was chosen. He was chosen to deliver us, but it was going to cost him everything to give up his life for us so we could be free from everything that hold us, holds us captive, holds us back from the story God wants to write for us. But he submitted voluntarily giving his life to show you that you are loved. So even as you take on a hard journey, the pain of it is because you are loved and God wants to do something beautiful and new in your life. Jesus wants to work something new in this season to get you unstuck. Will you let him? Because I think it's time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you that you don't give up on us, that you continue to work out your good purposes in our lives. We thank you that you want to keep working something new, and Lord, we acknowledge our weakness, we acknowledge our patterns, we acknowledge to the best of our ability that life has become unmanageable on our own, and so we invite you into this journey to move us forward, to get us on the road that you had have for us, to get us unstuck. Lord Jesus, give us the courage and ability to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.